As he writes this, he shares with us that this idea of this righteousness, if we understand this theology in the tomb, he talks about this righteousness. He says that we are the recipients of righteousness. How are we the recipients of righteousness? The text says that it has been credited to our account. Look at verse 24. It says, to whom it will be credited. This word credited is logizomai in the Greek, and it's in the present tense. And it simply means that it's a continuous action. It's in the passive voice, meaning that as an outside subject that's operating on the subject. And what happens is, he says that this continuous action, it suggests that we are righteous because God has imputed this righteousness to us. And what really happened is God charged it to our account. That means that we did not deserve this righteousness. We did not owe, own this righteousness, but this righteousness was owned by God. But because God loved us so much, he imputed this righteousness to us. He charged it to our our account in essence we were spiritually bankrupt we were broke but one day God saw us where we was and what he did he charged to our account in essence he made a direct deposit and what happens in direct deposit it's an ongoing deposit until you turn it off but the good part about this direct deposit as long as we are in Jesus it's never going to cut off it's never going to end so every time I get ready to go back and make a withdrawal on my righteousness there is something in my right righteousness account because it's been charged to my account that's why we can praise God right now that's why we can enjoy the righteousness that we have it's not because we're righteous in and of ourselves but that righteousness is contingent upon our connection to Christ he says but we are enjoyed the we are the recipients of this righteousness because we made the right response the text says it like this in verse 24. It says, not only is it credited to us, but it says, as those who believe in him. This word believe is pistuo from the root word pistis. And pistuo is in the present tense, active voice. Active voice means the subject is the doer of the action. Present tense means that it's an ongoing action. He's suggesting that our belief, this word pistuo means to have confidence or trust in somebody or something. He says the reason that we are recipients of this righteousness is because we have the right response. And the right response is to place the whole of our trust in this God who has raised Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead. So so what he is saying is that when we trust God, it's not just something that we do when it's convenient for us, but we must trust God all of the time. We must trust God in all situations. We must trust God when we can't even trace God. We must trust God when we can't even see God. We must trust God when we can't even tangibly, tangibly touch God, but he's a God that's always in our presence. He's a God that's always there. So he says that if you want to be a recipient of this righteousness, you have to always always trust in this God and I don't know about you but I thank God that I learned a long time ago how to trust in God I want to tell you beloved friends will let you down loved ones will leave you by yourself but thanks be to God if you place your trust in God he's a God that will never leave you nor will he forsake you is there anybody in this house can testify that you've ever trusted in God and he has never failed you yet You've had many people to fail you. You've had many people to let you down. But one person we can say without any, any reservation that has never let us down, and that is our God. Therefore, he has charged to our account this righteousness. Then he says to us that gives us this resounding revelation. Look at verse 24, the C portion. He says, our belief is in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He says the resounding revelation is that we see the providential power of God because who else could have raised someone from the dead? There are many gods who have died, but all of those gods who have died, none of those gods were resurrected. But our God, in Jesus Christ died but our God the Father raised him from the dead 
he says. I want to show you that this is, this is power that you can't quite understand. John Piper, the preaching pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, calls this inconceivable power. He says it's inconceivable power, not because you can't grasp it, but in a world of naturalism where there's this view of this fact that if it's not connected to nature, it really can't be true. And he picks up off what Rudolf Bultmann said, a German scholar, and he talks about what Bultmann says, but what he's trying to suggest to us is that no power can be compared to the power that our God has. And this is the kind of power that God exercised when Christ Jesus was in the tomb. He's, this is the kind of power that God exercised on Sarah's womb that was 90 years old and dead. But what the Lord did, he had power to touch that womb. And from that dead womb became a living son by the name of Isaac. And from that tomb where there was a dead man by the name of Jesus lying there, when God touched him, he raised him from the dead. And from that tomb, there was a man by the name of Jesus that got out of that tomb. And the Bible says he folded his grave clothes just to know that let the show that there was evidence that he was there but the stone was rolled away that we could look in to see that he was no longer there and I don't know about you but I thank God for that kind of power in my God that can go to a tomb and raise a dead man from the grave and from that grave he stands on resurrection ground and declares all power in my hand I got three minutes says to us, then he gives us this reality of redemption. Verse 25, it says, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions, he was raised because of our justification. In this one verse, God packages his entire plan of redemption. In this one verse, he packages something that shows us that there is something unique about the redemptive plan that he has for his people. Watch the text. It says, he who was delivered. This word delivered is parodidomai. Para means alongside didomai, which means to give. Simply suggesting in the aorist tense that it's a completed action. And it's in the passive voice, which means an outside entity operates on the subject. It was God who gave over his son for your sins and for mine. In essence, what he did was when we were in the court and we wanted to be acquitted, it was by the grace of God that we were acquitted of our crime. Yes, we were guilty of the crime. But when they brought all of the evidence and the evidence said guilty, our paraclete showed up. And that paraclete was our defense attorney who is Jesus Christ. While the prosecutor, the devil, was trying to find us guilty and the judge is God sitting in the courtroom. But thanks be to God for my paraclete who says, wait a minute, the charges must be dropped because they've already been paid for on Calvary's cross. That's why I can praise him right now because I realize and I know that I should have been locked up. I know that I should have been on death row, but thanks be to God, my charges have been dropped. Don't you know we had charges against us that should have found us guilty, but thanks be to God, our father, his son Jesus showed up in the courtroom at the right time, and we ought to praise him right now because he showed up, but he didn't charge us anything for defending us. He didn't send us a bill for defending us, but thanks be to God for the peril did of my mom. But not only was he handed over by God, in this whole narrative of the passion of Christ, Jesus was handed over by Judas. Not only was he handed over by Judas, but he was handed over by the Sanhedrin council to Pilate. Not only was he handed over to Pilate, but Pilate handed him over to the people. And not only did Pilate hand him over to the people, but he handed him over to the executioners. But the real truth of the matter, all of those are parodied on my moments. But the real handing over was when God handed him over to death. Because you do know the executioners didn't kill him. Pilate didn't kill him. The Sanhedrin council didn't kill him. But the Bible says, he says, no man take my life, but I lay it down. And I thank God that no man could take his life. 
And I thank God for the peril did of my moments in my life, in my Christ's life. It's because he handed himself over. It was because God handed him over to the enemy. It's because God handed him over to death that now he died for your sins and for mine. And because he died for your sins and for mine, the Bible says that God raised him from the dead for my justification. He's simply saying that when you placed him in the tomb, I am satisfied that he died enough.